It's great to see you all, and uh, yeah, so I'm uh, I'm here from Snowplow, and I want to talk about about Snowplow today. Um, so, who am I? What is Snowplow? So, um, I'm Alex Dean, one of the two co-founders of Snowplow, also the CEO, and I've been kind of working at the intersection of behavioral data, data warehousing, BI, um, and increasingly ML uh, for for years. Uh, I co-founded Snowplow with Yali, um, who's not here today. He's back in London. Uh, back in 2012, so we've been building Snowplow for 10 years, and uh, I, wrote a, I wrote a book, uh, but there are no copies of the book here. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the Ternary boys have got, got you covered on that in a bit. Um, so what is Snowplow? I'll talk about Snowplow uh, in a moment, but fundamentally, it's a behavioral data platform, and it helps companies to create very rich, proprietary, first-party data on how their own customers are interacting with their own digital products and, and apps and things like that. Um, we created it to kind of uh, level the playing field. So back in 2012, there were a lot of, um, lot of kind of startups and big data companies on the West Coast that could generate this very rich proprietary data. Um, outside of the West Coast, no one could really do it. So on the East Coast, in Northern Europe, in Australia, um, people didn't have this capability. So we created it, we open sourced it, and uh, we've been doing that ever since. So um, fast forward to today. And companies are investing more and more in data apps. What is a data app? It's a way of essentially putting together very rich data and using that to drive competitive advantage in your business. And so we have a couple of, uh, couple of examples here. We have Strava. Um, Strava has been a Snowplow customer for some time. And they generate 4 billion events per day um, with Snowplow. And that drives into Snowflake. And then they build all sorts of cool uh, data apps on the other side of it, including a lot of the, the Strava UI and a lot of the reporting and analytics that you see. Um, DPG Media is a, is a media group uh, in Europe, and they do similar stuff in the publishing industry. We have a lot of customers in, in media. So a, a Peter Norvig quote, more data beats clever algorithms, but better data beats more data. And Snowplow, we've been about creating better data for, for some years. Um, we started using a term quite recently um, called data exhaust, and that's kind of caught on quite quickly in the industry. Um, so what do we mean by data exhaust? What we really mean is that there's a bunch of different package tools out there, and everyone's adopted um, different flavors of those, like packaged uh, analytics tools, CDPs, mobile analytics. So everyone's adopted a bunch of different package tools, and those are generating data, but it's really a byproduct. The, the systems are not intended to generate this data. People are just pulling that data out of these systems because they want to use it for different purposes. And that typically ends up landing in some sort of data storage. And then the, the data team, the long-suffering data team, have to work on that data and try and get it ready for, for downstream use cases. Um, but it's not easy. And in particular, increasingly, people are finding that this data exhaust is not well suited to AI, to advanced ML use cases. Um, why is that? So the data is difficult to understand. It's hard to build features from it. Um, there are you end up with a lot of different isolated tables. You've got to do a lot of validation because the data is kind of untrustworthy. The structures are irregular. Um, and then you've got the whole kind of data sovereignty, compliance, GDPR, and things like that. So it's just it's not great to be building advanced data apps and data products off that data. Um, here's a kind of example. So if you've got, if you've got these kinds of um, kind of click stream, event stream data from, extracted from these SaaS tools, um, you get kind of weird event names, like people have grappled with this for years. Um, you've got fields, you don't understand what they are. You've got uh, timestamps, you don't trust them. Um, you've got like things like IP addresses, and you're like, I shouldn't, I shouldn't even have this in my data. Um, and so as we were starting to think about this, um, we realized that we'd been building something very different at Snowplow for some time. And we've started calling that data creation. So it's the idea of deliberately creating data to power these downstream data apps and advanced analytics and uh, AI use cases. So on the left, you see like if you're starting with these SaaS platforms, you end up with an awful lot of data prep work that you need to do. And teams hate doing data prep work. It's not value adding. And it's only by the time you get to the bottom of that that you can actually you know, do cool stuff using things like Data IQ and uh, Data Robot with that data. If you compare that to data creation, like because you're deliberately creating this data, because you're creating it in a very schematized way, it's much quicker to get to the feature, 
engineering, it's much quicker to get to the model training. Um, and so when we talk about data creation, what we're really saying is the data is much easier to understand, it's much more flexible, it's much more compliant. Um, it's also real time, so you're creating this data in real time flows, you're not waiting for a process, an ETL process to kind of pull it out of your, uh, your SaaS system every night. And it's trusted, so you kind of um, sort of see it from, from, from source to target, so you understand exactly how that data was created and you have all the lineage on it as well. Um, so what's the, what's the Snowplow approach to data creation? How do we do this? Um, so first of all, we generate the data. So we have a bunch of different SDKs, tracking SDKs, um, on a variety of different platforms. And it's those SDKs, you embed them and they start, uh, you instrument them to, to emit that data, to create that data into the rest of Snowplow. Then it comes into the Snowplow pipeline, and we enhance the data, so we do a lot of validation on it, we enrich the data, we do a lot of dimension widening on it. Um, and then we, we model it. So we land it inside your data warehouse or your data lake. So we support Snowflake and Databricks and Redshift and BigQuery. Um, and we do a lot of like processing on that, unification, aggregation to make that data uh, more useful for, uh, for data products. And it's also available in stream as well in, in real time. So that's the focus. We focus on the creation. We don't really focus on the consumption. So on the consumption side, you know, you'll want to do um, AI use cases, BI use cases, uh, reverse ETL off the data is becoming very popular as well. Um, so there's all sorts of different consumption patterns, um, but that's not, our, that's not our focus. Our focus is on creating this really great data, getting it into your warehouse or lake house, um, and then the data teams that adopt Snowplow will solve cool different problems with it. And then underlying all of it, you've got, you've got governance always, which is, which is always key. So I want to I want to talk a bit more about behavioral data because behavioral data is is a term we only started using about a year and a half ago, um, but it's 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 kind of stuck in the industry and it's a it's a valuable way of describing the kind of data that Snowplow does. So if you think about this kind of uh, chart here, uh, you start with systems data, the kind of the where where's that occurring? It's happening on servers, it's happening in applications, and then you've got transactional data. Um, so you know you've got all of the the data coming out of your um, your transactional data stores. You've got demographic data, we'll come back to that in a second, and then you've got this behavioral data. And funnily enough, uh, the reason that Yali and I started Snowplow in 2012 was that we were doing these kind of customer 360 consulting projects, and our clients were able to give us loads of transactional data, loads of demographic data, but they couldn't give us any behavioral data. They would say things like, log into Google Analytics and get what you need, and that's not what we wanted. We wanted you know, the full fire hose of that kind of very rich, granular behavioral signal, and that's, that's why we started building, building Snowplow. So this, I had to update this slide very recently uh, for kind of obvious reasons. Um, so demographic data, like what is demographic data? So uh, you've got two users. They, uh, they might have the same demographic properties, uh, and actually they're very different. Why are they very different? Because they have very different behavior, but that doesn't show up in an individual demographic record. It's only when you start to really mine their actual behavior and understand what's different about it. Uh, transactional data gives you a little bit of a view of what's going on, but behavioral data really gives you the super rich journey of, of, of you know, that, that person. And so that's why, that's why we're all about behavioral data. Um, how do we structure that? Uh, so we've been, we've been sort of nerding out on this kind of uh, data language for some time. Uh, we need to do a better job of sort of communicating it and talking about it. Uh, but think of it really as pretty similar to human language. So you know, think of a sentence where you've got a subject of, a, the, subject of the action, you've got the verb, you've got the main object, um, and then you've got other kind of entities, other, other objects, indirect objects going on. And so you put that together, you, you, if you describe behavior, human behavior in that way, you get to very, very granular uh, descriptions of what's happened in the past. And those are highly, highly predictive um, for machine learning. So re remember that Snowplow is 10 years old, like, um, and we've had an open source community all that time, and we've had paying customers since 2015. Every year, we'd kind of go back to our paying customers and we'd say, you guys are just using this for BI, right? You're just using it with like Tableau or Looker and just doing reporting on it. And every year they'd say, yeah, yeah, don't, that's all we're doing. We're not doing any AI or anything like that. 
And about two years ago, or just under, that started to shift and people started saying, no, no, of course we're doing AI, of course we're using this for ML, um, because this behavioral signal is incredibly predictive. And so some of those, not all of them, but some of those signals for some of those data products and apps and use cases will be highly, highly predictive compared to, for example, you know, demographic attributes or transactional uh, fields. So um, yeah, put Snowplow together, and what have we got? So we've got thousands of organizations using our open source technology. We've got a, you know, we've been building the thing for 10 years, you know, hundreds of person years of engineering, and, and some great, great brands using our open source, um, and some great customers as well, including, including a bunch in New York. Um, so I want to talk about two use cases now. Um, so you know, I've kind of talked about behavioral data. I've talked about data creation. Um, it probably all sounds cool, but like people are very happy with data extraction using ETL tools. They're happy with data replication tools. Happy with kind of all the different ingest paths into their um, into their warehouse or their lake house. So why are they? Why are pre why are people? Why are companies adopting uh, behavioral data so rapidly at the moment? So here are a couple of big kind of killer apps, if you will. The first one I want to talk about briefly is first-party digital analytics. And the second is something, a kind of a new movement called composable CDP. So if we talk first about uh, first-party digital analytics, um, there's a really big movement at the moment around kind of maintaining your data sovereignty in a world of things like GDPR, CCPA, um, the, imp the rights of data subjects are only getting more important. Um, and so a lot of organizations are starting to think about, okay, let's move those digital analytics workloads from kind of inside third-party tools where it's kind of a bit hazy, where the data lives, how the data is being used by third parties, and bringing it into a kind of a first-party environment that's owned by the brand. And then composable CDP, so CDP, customer data platform, it's kind of a MarTech term. Um, and the idea here really is a different approach to building a CDP. It's a composable approach using Snowplow and some other vendors. And it really helps you kind of move your CDP from a kind of a point solution, a kind of a, uh, an individual package to, um, to basically being Snowflake or Databricks or BigQuery. That becomes your CDP. Um, so that's pretty, pretty cool as well. And those are big, th th these two are really big for us at the moment. Um, so here's first party digital analytics. So essentially, it's a combination. So you'll bring Snowplow in, uh, you'll land the data into something like Snowflake or Databricks. Then we have a bunch of DBT models that work on the data, make it more ready for things like web analytics. Um, and then you'll put a, a BI tool on top. Um, so people use everything, but uh, we see a lot of looker usage and uh, ThoughtSpot. We're seeing a uh, growing adoption of ThoughtSpot as well, which is kind of cool. And then the composable CDP. So um, pretty much what I just said. So essentially, you have this idea of data collection. You're generating your first party behavioral data using Snowplow. You're using something like Fivetran to get kind of the transactional data in there alongside. Then it kind of all comes into Databricks or Snowflake or similar. And inside there, we're building uh, a customer golden record. We're building a rich behavioral data profile. And once you've done that, you can then build audience segments. And you can then use a tool like HighTouch to activate that data out. So essentially, kind of get those audience segments going back out to your um, engagement hub or your uh, marketing systems or, or whatever. So this one is really, uh, it's quite new, uh, but it's, 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 becoming, it's becoming really popular. Um, and then like, I, I don't want to go into it in too much detail, but like, you can imagine other industries as well. So we're very big in healthcare now. Uh, media is really big. So uh, media brands have obviously had a very difficult 10 or 20 years, and they, they've now uh, got really impressive data teams that are building very rich uh, data products on top of Snowplow dynamic paywalls, subscription management, editorial analytics, all that kind of stuff. And retail, retail's really interesting. So um, before COVID, uh, there was not very much adoption of, of Snowplow in retail. Um, and then basically what happened is through COVID, these big retailers in the UK, US and, and, and beyond really started building out data teams, really started taking their kind of digital experiences very seriously and, and wanting to, to generate all this data and understand their, um, their customer behavior much more deeply. Um, so yeah, this is a quick slide on the, the commercial product. So 
Um, the Snowplow core technology has been around for 10 years, um, open source Apache 2 licensed um, and continues to, uh, to be developed very, very actively. We have a very large team of engineers working on that. Um, but then we also have this commercial wrapper as well, which we call uh, Snowplow BDP. And that has a bunch of governance features um, and a lot of data contracts UI as well. So we have a lot of um, workflows inside the, uh, the, the, the paid for product that help uh, data producers to create the data in a very structured, uh, schematized, predictable way. Uh, and then we have increasing amounts of kind of tooling to help uh, data consumers on the other side navigate that, navigate that data. Um, and then we run it, we run it all for our customers as well. Um, so yeah, I'm 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 early, but um, but yeah, how to get started? So open source, it's been out there for uh, for a long time, and we're always working to make it easier to adopt. Um, so we have an open source quick start. Uh, we also have try Snowplow, so we have an easy kind of hosted way of getting started with Snowplow. And then the data product accelerators is quite fun as well. So uh, one of the things we kept getting feedback on over the years was. Snowplow was a very powerful toolkit, but people weren't quite sure how to get started with it. They weren't quite sure what kind of data products or data apps to build with it. And so we're building out a big kind of library of data product accelerators um, to basically say, in this industry, this use case, here's some templates, here's some DBT or some schemas or, or whatever it is to kind of get people started. Um, because really, it's a, it's a very horizontal platform, and you could build any kind of data product you want with it. So we're trying to help people to, to figure out which ones they want to build with it. And yeah, that is, that's all my slides. So you started 10 years ago. Tell us about the history of the company. 10 years ago, yes. So uh, Yali and I started it uh, 10 years ago. We'd, uh, we'd met at an ad tech company uh, a few years before that. And uh, yeah, we were doing these consulting projects, figured out the gap in the market, launched it open source made it run native on AWS. And, uh, and yeah, and it was, just, it was just Yali and I in a room for sort of three years, driving each other potty, <laughs> working on kind of project community fit. Um, and then in 2015, we started building a team around it because uh, there was enough kind of inbound interest. Uh, basically, people were coming to us and saying they liked Snowplow. Uh, they wanted it running in their own AWS account, but they didn't know how. And so we basically built a team to do that and, uh, and charged them for it and uh, bootstrapped up until 2019. Yeah, that, that was very early, 2012, uh, to this whole like modern data stack kind of, uh, kind yeah, of it world. Didn't, it didn't seem that modern back then. Yes, yeah. <laughs> like, Any uh, lessons learned uh, you know, along the way in terms of, I don't know, building the company or something that surprised you? We have a... You know, typically a bunch of people that are in early startups or starting businesses, any hard-worn lesson you learn along the way? I think, um, I think the community stuff is really important. So um, we did a lot of grassroots meetups and things like that, a lot like this. And I think, I think a lot of tech is adopted almost city by city. And so I think that one of the things we got right in the early years was focusing on a few cities like New York, Berlin, London to really grow the, really grow the scene there. And then you get positive word of mouth. Um, so I think that was really important. And then I think how do you measure the success of your community? Is that, is that a lot of people? Is that people who are very engaged, people who are contributing to the open source project? Yeah, with, with us, it was always kind of inbound. So it was always people getting in touch and saying they'd heard about it, and um, they hadn't even used Snowplow themselves, but they were interested in like you know buying from us or whatever. So, so that, was a big, that was always big for us, yeah. Okay, so community first, community big. big lesson. What, what, what else? Um, I, th I think you've got to look a lot at the wider technology trends. So when we, when we launched Snowplow in 2012, um, Redshift hadn't even come out yet. So we were just working with um, uh, Apache Hive on, on, on Elastic MapReduce. And it was a really clunky experience. In the Hadoop world? The Hadoop, well, exactly, the Hadoop world. And then uh, AWS told us that they were working on Redshift. We got early access to it. and. A lot of that kind of initial hockey stick of the open source adoption of Snowplow was basically coinciding with like massive, you know, tryout and adoption of Redshift. So I think you've got to, in the modern data set, you've got to sort of time it with what else is happening and how the whole how the whole scene is evolving. And how do you do that? You just spend a lot of time in 
events like this or online or how do you yeah i i think those things and then just seeing what people are ta seeing what people are talking about um on different platforms seeing seeing what customers and open source users are, are, are using your technology with as well great all right i want to open up to questions if anybody has any i want to hear okay thank you for a very interesting talk i love the technology side of everything i want to ask you a more philosophical question okay so it's about behavior. Yeah. So is there any expectation that you would like to change a person's behavior, whether it's somebody using your app, your data, uh, government, any institution, that they would like their customers or their users to go from behavior A to behavior B? Hopefully, behavior B is better than behavior A. So in that context, do you think this technology will actually help to do that? And what is the track record of trying to change people's behavior? Mm, I think I think that's I think that's a really it's an interesting area. So when we when we started using the sort of term behavioral data, kind of last spring, I think it was, we we got some pushback from people. They were like, "Oh, this sounds a bit sort of spooky." You know, this sounds like oh, human behavior. Like, you know, first you'll be observing it, and then you'll be influencing it, and and you know, as an open source project, uh, we're in an interesting position, right? We've always been Apache 2 licensed. As you guys know, Apache 2 doesn't have any kind of stipulations on how you use the software. And so by definition, people can be out there using Snowplow open source kind of for anything. And we won't even necessarily know about that. Obviously, we can be much more prescriptive with our, with our customers. Um, but, but, but I think to answer your question, brands are first trying to understand human behavior and that is not easy and then you know through increasing use of things like machine learning they're trying to predict it and understand you know which which segments of audience are going to be more profitable or whatever and then i think i think as we get into shaping human behavior it does yeah it does become a kind of a more ethical question and yeah we have an ethics committee at snowplow kind of looking at more 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 kind of like involved customer use cases and, and figuring out kind of our views on that. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a complex area. Philosophical. Right, next question. Hey, thank you so much. Um, you probably get this question a lot, but how do you compare Snowplow with uh, Google Analytics and segments and other sort of off the shelf things that you can just get? Yeah, so the, uh, the question was how do we compare Snowplow to uh, more like kind of packaged tools like Google Analytics or um, more like kind of CDIs and CDPs like, like Segment. So um, it's a good question. So uh, like they're quite different. So with a, with a package tool, so let's say a packaged analytics tool, um, that's really a kind of an end-to-end -end experience. And, you know, it'll deliver a bunch of UIs and screens and workflows that an, a data consumer can just jump in and, and work with directly. Snowplow is kind of different from that. Snowplow is much more like the underlying engine of one of those tools, and you could build what you want with it. So you could build an alternative to GA with it. You could build an alternative to you know, Amplitude or whatever with it if you want. Um, but you're very likely to end up building something much more bespoke because you're going to build something that's much more tailored to your, your business. And uh, what we see is that once you get outside of certain kind of you know sort of market segments companies have very specific needs around this kind of behavioral data and understanding their customer behavior and their business models as well aren't very well reflected in those tools so you know google analytics for example is pretty decent if you're a, a news publisher it's pretty good if you're kind of a standard uh, retailer once you go outside of those um, it, you know it, it, it's much less kind of uh, tailored to those to those other industries um, on, on the segment side of things, so we've kind of um, we've kind of grown up alongside segments. So I think segments started at pretty much the same time as us, 2013, I think. And the, the way I kind of explain the difference is, um, it's almost like one of those kind of uh, RTS games. It's like a different tech tree. So segment kind of evolved in a way that was much more around um, simple event JSON structures. And then the ability to kind of relay those out to lots of different downstream SaaS tools. Snowplow started much more from kind of analytical uh, mindset, more like data team mindset, uh, less growth team, more data team mindset. And so we've always had very rich behavioral data models. Um, and then uh, we try and help companies to build rich data products off those in the warehouse or, or the data lake. Um, but we don't do that kind of 
event forwarding to like loads of different SaaS destinations. So it's kind of like, it's, it's sort of like we evolved into in separate directions, really. All right, one last question here. Hi, Alex. That was a great overview. I'm just wondering if you could provide a, a more specific use case, maybe in the retail side, of something that you saw during the lockdown for, for retail, either a specific company or general trend. Um, yeah, sure. So the uh, question is a more specific use case. Um, so I could go retail or maybe maybe I'll do kind of like um, financial services because we're, we're in New York and, and I was in a FinServe meeting earlier. So this is a super fun one. Um, the Snowplow behavioral data is incredibly good at figuring out if someone's filling, it, filling out an application form, let's say for a financial product, uh, fraudulently. So basically, if you're filling out a form fraudulently, actually your behaviors are super different from if you're filling it out genuinely. So like, you know, a fraudster will probably copy paste their name into a box. It's not really their name. Um, and so that signal's been used by a bunch of different um, uh, FinServe companies, including here, to kind of build uh, fraud detection products off of. So that's a nice example of where the behavioral signal's way more predictive than, uh, than, than transactional demographic data. Thank you. All right, on this note, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Matt.